We're just about out of time. Coming up tomorrow, here on Live at 4, Lisa Briggs from the Bruce Company will be along. She's going to bring in some spring, hopefully. Some color. That'll yes. make you feel like spring. That'll and we're going to talk good. to Consumer Reports as well. They're going to tell us how to best avoid the flu and what to do if you get it. <laughs> Eric needs to hear that. <laughs> That's coming up tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks for watching. News 3 at 5 starts right now. Right now in five, a homicide investigation underway in Sauk County after a man is found dead outside a casino. What's next for Jamie Kloss's accused kidnapper, Jake Patterson? What a local defense attorney is saying about his case. And Democratic Governor Tony Evers says he told Republican lawmakers he will push for expanding Medicaid, how both sides tonight are reacting. News three at five. Thanks for staying with News 3. A homicide suspect is at large tonight. Sauk County authorities are looking for 68-year-old Robert Pulvermacher of rural Middleton. He is wanted in a homicide in the town of Delton. And that is where News 3's Killy Arthur joins us now live. Killy? That's right. Police say that they don't have the name of the victim yet or they're not able to release it. But he is an 80-year-old man. They say he was murdered and found in his car at this Ho-Chunk Casino parking lot in the town of Delton. Now, authorities are looking for 68-year-old Robert Pulvermacher. You can see him here. He is the suspect in this case. They're also looking for another younger man. Authorities have released this photo of him, but say they don't know his identity. News 3 was on the scene yesterday, the day the body was found in the lot. They say the suspect is known to frequent casinos here and in Madison. And the victim was reported missing on Monday, last seen by his family Sunday. The deputy made contact with the vehicle shortly after, I believe it was 1 o'clock. Um, the report of the missing person was at 11.17 in the morning. And the deputy located the vehicle right around 1 p.m. Paul Vermarker is currently on community supervision with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. He has passed burglary convictions. A warrant has been issued for his arrest. He is a resident in the town of rural Middleton. Now, authorities say they are actively looking for this suspect. If you have any information, be sure to contact them or Madison area Crime Stoppers. Also of note, Ho-Chunk released a statement saying that they are very sorry for what has happened and that they're committed to patron safety. We'll keep you updated on this evolving case on channel3000.com and on News 3 at 6. Kelly Arthur reporting live. Kelly, thank you. A Milwaukee area man facing charges of first-degree reckless homicide and party to a crime of hiding a corpse after two bodies were found on land he is leasing in Walworth County near East Troy. You may recall reports of that large police presence on the property last Thursday. 43-year-old Mark Newman of Franklin is now charged. A criminal complaint says two men were reported missing who had worked for Newman's cleaning business. Tests are still being done to confirm the identities of those bodies found in the burn pit. Newman due back in court next week. Right now, a jury is deliberating in a case where a man is accused of killing Jesse Faber. 60-year-old Daniel Leesky accused of killing Faber last January. Leesky and his girlfriend have both pleaded guilty to hiding Faber's body in a storage unit in Rio. Leesky contends he didn't intentionally kill Faber. Prosecutors said Leesky shot Faber five times and hid his body in that storage unit in Rio, 30 miles from where he was last seen in Marshall. Leesky faces a maximum of 12 years in prison for hiding Faber's body. A Madison man was arrested yesterday afternoon in connection with an out-of-state homicide investigation. Madison police say 48-year-old Angelo Myers was arrested on a homicide warrant at his home in the 7900 block of Tree Lane. Prior to his arrest, Chicago police confirmed to Madison police that they have an active homicide warrant for Myers. All right, a look now at First Alert Weather. Meteorologist Dave Caulfield joining us on the weather patio. Dave, what's happening out there? Well, Eric, that front is getting closer. You can here in the wind behind me it's been picking up over the last hour or so and that's good news if we want to see the sunshine because that front will sweep all these clouds out of here and we should be dealing with uh, some sunny skies or at least partly sunny skies tomorrow but for today the third or fourth straight day of just straight gloom on visible cloud track lots of clouds sticking around Doppler track a few blips showing up especially north of Madison over the past few hours there's a chance of some more patchy drizzle or patchy freezing drizzle 
Capitol as we go forward into this evening. But by the overnight hours, I think we'll just be dealing with partly cloudy skies. Mostly cloudy skies in Madison. The WISC TV sky cam currently at 30 degrees, but with that wind picking up a little bit, wind chill making it feel more like 22 degrees. 31 in Lone Rock, 32 in Mineral Point, 29 in Monroe, but wind chills are in the teens and low 20s across southern Wisconsin. So those temperatures are hanging out near the freezing mark tonight. And again, some patchy freezing drizzle is possible. So keep that in mind, especially west of Madison. So a few more slippery roads are possible tonight into tomorrow. And temperatures will be starting off in the mid 20s by tomorrow morning. We'll talk about that sunshine returning and the chances for some snowflakes by the weekend in your first alert forecast in just a few minutes. All right, Dave, thank you. The question is looming of whether or not Jamie Kloss's kidnapper, Jake Patterson, will go to trial. Patterson is facing two counts of first degree intentional homicide, one count of kidnapping and one count of armed robbery. Jamie Perez spoke with a defense attorney here in Madison and she joins us now with possible outcomes to expect in the coming days. Jamie? That's right. Well, as of right now, we don't know if this case will make it to trial depending on what Patterson's plea will be. But when I spoke with the defense attorney this afternoon, there are several outcomes that are quite possible here. If Patterson pleads not guilty on any of the charges, it would go to trial. But the question there would be, can they find an impartial jury? They may have to either move this case to another county or bring in a jury from another county for that to be possible. Now, Patterson's defense attorneys are reviewing the statements made in the criminal complaint we received yesterday, checking police reports and reviewing evidence to find out whether the statements made in Patterson's questioning were properly obtained or if any of them are admissible. So there's a lot of different outcomes to consider here, but the de defense attorney I spoke with said he doesn't think it's likely this will be a case where Patterson could plead insanity. He went to such great lengths to conceal his identity. So that shows that he had a knowledge that what he was doing was not was wrong. So not guilty by a mental disease or defect or insanity defense means that you either didn't know right from wrong or you could not comport your conduct with to the societal norms. The charges that are filed right now pertain only to Barron County. There could be additional charges filed in Douglas County as well, where Patterson was keeping Jamie for 88 days. Now, the Douglas County District Attorney's Office was not able to say whether or not there would be additional charges filed, as this is a, still a very active investigation. So we'll keep you updated on those details as they become available. All right, Jamie Perez reporting. Jamie, thank you. Meanwhile, Patterson has been transferred to a different jail. Patterson had been held in the Barron County Jail since his arrest Thursday. He has now been moved to Polk County. Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald confirmed that one of Jamie's relatives works at the Barron County facility. He called the transfer an administrative decision and said no one threatened Patterson. Missing child agencies are celebrating Jamie's story as a way to push forward with positivity. According to the FBI, in 2018, there were more than 424,000 entries for missing children nationwide. More than 92% were endangered runaways, 4% were family abductions, 1% were lost or injured children, and just 1% were non-family abductions like the Jamie Kloss case. The vice president of the Missing Children Division at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children says it doesn't matter the nature of the case because each case is just as important to them. Here at the National Center, uh, no child's case will ever be closed uh, with our with our teams until the child has been physically found. Just because we know there are other Jamie Clauses out there. Right now, there are still 50 children in Wisconsin listed as missing on the agency's database. Meanwhile, the Douglas County Sheriff is reacting to Jamie's return home. Douglas County Sheriff Tom Dahlbeck says people have been congratulating him and his office, but he says there is one true hero in this whole ordeal, and that is Jamie. Her resolve and courage is amazing. He also thanked Jeannie Nutter, the woman who found Jamie, Amy Pullen, who was the dispatcher who received the 911 call and Sergeant Matt DeRosha, who stopped and arrested Patterson. Next at five, we're learning more about the laws that could be passed at the Capitol and which issues will have a more difficult time getting through. This follows a rare closed door meeting between both Senate and Assembly Republicans and Governor Tony Evers. The governor left saying he will continue to fight for things like Medicaid expansion, even though Republicans are saying they won't budge. Our Amanda Quintana is here with reaction from both sides. Amanda. 
Yes, well, with Republicans still the majority in the legislature and a new Democratic governor starting his term, both sides feel it's important to start out by getting to know each other, the issues they can tackle together and the ones they just won't agree on. Behind this door, a rare meeting between Republican lawmakers and new Democratic Governor Tony Evers. Meant to be the start of a conversation, both sides are hoping involves compromise. This is one area that I know there is definite agreement, is that just because you have divided government doesn't mean that nothing's going to get done. But when they emerged, we learned more about what they won't agree on. They made it clear that the issue of Medicaid expansion was, not, was a non-starter for them. I would prefer for us to find areas that are not going to automatically kind of devolve into a big argument. Assembly Speaker Robin Voss says some things are just off the table. So on things like a dramatic increase in income or sales taxes on business or homeowners, I think that'd be a non-starter with us. Uh, at least for our caucus, I think expanding government run health care uh, is a non-starter too. Evers says he will respectfully still submit the Medicaid expansion as part of the budget. We will continue to fight for that and uh, uh, we feel very confident that we will win that. Point. An area they did seem to come together on. He made the commitment that he would not touch WDC in this budget. So I think that's a huge victory. During his campaign, Evers wanted to eliminate the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, saying the $3 billion deal made with Foxconn was too expensive. We need to make sure that we're good uh, stewards of the money, so we're going to hold their feet to the fire. Now convinced WEDC is succeeding and will be transparent, something both sides want. Under the deal that we voted for, not a dollar goes out until a shovel's in the ground or someone actually gets a paycheck. That is something that all of us agree on. We want to make sure that the terms of that deal are kept. Republicans acknowledged how unique a meeting like this one was, thanking Evers for coming and hoping it's not the last time he sits down with them. But obviously, they have very different beliefs on a lot of issues, but they both said they will agree to at least try to come to common ground. Okay, at least that one's not a non-starter. Yes, okay, trying. Good. All right, Amanda, thank Thanks, you. Amanda. Democrats in the legislature say their priorities for the next two years will be to provide the state with a fresh start by undoing Republican policies that Democrats say have undermined democracy. Democratic legislative priorities include having nonpartisan redistricting reform, ending unlimited campaign donations, changing the state constitution to enhance the state's open meetings and open records law as it pertains to the legislature, and barring any lame duck sessions between an election and the start of a new legislative session. It is time to put an end to sudden hearings and surprise votes sometimes at four in the morning, that have been the hallmarks of a broken system, producing laws that benefit a few, not the average citizen. Democrats have little chance of passing what they want, given that Republicans are in the majority in both the Senate and the Assembly. Two Wisconsin wedding barn owners are suing Governor Tony Evers' administration, seeking to ensure that they don't need to obtain liquor licenses in order to hold private parties where alcohol is served. The lawsuit being filed today in Dunn County Circuit Court. It comes after an informal legal opinion in November from then Attorney General Brad Schimmel, who said Private events held in public spaces require liquor licenses. Governor Evers spokeswoman says incoming Revenue Secretary Peter Barca and the governor are still learning more about this issue. Students from Craig High School in Janesville are presenting more than $10,000 to a family impacted by cancer. The money is going to help the family of Isaac Johnson, a four-year-old Janesville boy who has neuroblastoma. Teens from the school's student council raised the money over the month of December and are continuing to raise money by selling Isaac Strong t-shirts. His family says through the battle of cancer, little moments like this mean the most. Oh, buddy. Yeah. Good luck to him. Absolutely. And more to come at 5 up next. It is day 25 of the partial government shutdown. Democrats and Republicans continue to blame each other. Plus, questions about the Russia investigation dominate the confirmation hearing for President Trump's attorney general nominee. And on Wall Street, the Dow closing with a solid Tuesday gain, 156 points. The Nasdaq up 118. The S&P added almost 28. We'll be right back.
The longest government shutdown of U.S. history has now entered day 25. House Republicans emerged from a White House meeting with President Trump, bashing their Democratic colleagues. The president invited several moderate House Democrats to attend lunch, but none were in attendance. In a letter to President Trump, several Senate Democrats urged the president to meet with federal workers impacted by the shutdown and called on him to bring it to an end. The American people suffering the dire consequences of this shutdown can no longer afford to wait for the president to come around. They could stand with common sense, with border experts, with federal workers, or they could continue to remain passive spectators. Meanwhile, the Internal Revenue Service is recalling about 46,000 of its employees furloughed by the government shutdown, nearly 60 percent of its workforce, to handle tax returns and pay out refunds, but the employees themselves will not be paid. Attorney General nominee William Barr faced the Senate Judiciary Panel and lots of questions about special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into possible Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Barr contradicted President Trump's frequent character of the Russia investigation. Do you believe Mr. Mueller would be involved in a witch hunt against anybody? I don't, I don't believe Mr. Mueller would, would uh, be involved in a witch hunt. Now, a second panel of witnesses will testify tomorrow before the Senate Judiciary Committee regarding Barr's nomination. If he passes a vote by the committee, he will then face a full Senate vote in the coming weeks. Let's head out to the weather patio now. It was chilly this afternoon, mm. windy too. Dave, Dave's like, tell me about it. I'm out here and you're inside. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to grab the earmuffs. I forgot them for first weather, uh, Eric and Susan. But that cold front getting closer and closer. It's going to knock our temperatures down into the low to mid 20s tonight. But it will finally get these stubborn, stubborn clouds out of here. By the time we get to tomorrow, I expect more sunshine as we head into Wednesday. Some of those clouds may try and stick around, but not all that much and nothing compared to today. So on weather track, we could see that cold front getting closer and closer with high pressure to our south and some milder air as well. And along this cold front, I wouldn't be surprised if a little bit of patchy freezing drizzle tried to form once again. We still do have the clouds and a lot of moisture in the atmosphere it really hasn't been going anywhere. So some flurries, maybe some patchy freezing drizzle are still possible this evening, but by the time we get to early tomorrow morning, we should see a much different weather picture. Our time lapse in Madison, the Edgewater Sky Cam. Is that a time lapse or is that just the same picture over and over again? That's kind of the way it's been feeling over the last few days because the clouds just haven't really moved all that much. And similar story showing up right now on the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison. Temperatures are in the low 30s and that's the high for today, 30 degrees. So still above normal, if you can believe that. It didn't really feel feel like it for much of today, feeling kind of raw and damp and just a little bit gloomy outside. Our Doppler track is not really all that active right now, but we do still have winter weather bulletins, especially west of Madison until midnight tonight for some more patchy freezing drizzle. And that's the thing with freezing drizzle. You really can't see it all that well on radar a lot of times. So just be prepared for some more slippery roads tonight. But by the time we get to tomorrow morning, I think that picture will improve. I know a lot of us want the snow picture to improve. Still stuck at 9.7 inches of snow for this winter. We are about 14 inches behind schedule, and now we're behind what we were at this time last year. So we got to get it going, Mother Nature. And Mother Nature saying, well, may I interest you in some cold weather? Because that is what is coming by the weekend, the start of next week with lows near zero for tonight. Patchy freezing drizzle is possible, becoming partly cloudy. Temperatures in the 20s for tomorrow. We're partly sunny, a little colder, but I do think that sun finally makes an appearance. So a couple of flurries and patches of freezing drizzle are possible tonight, but shouldn't be all that significant. A few slippery roads are possible, however. And look at that. The clouds basically disappearing on future track for a lot of tomorrow. I wouldn't go that far, but I do think some sunshine comes our way. But the clouds do come back quickly Wednesday night and on Thursday, a few flurries are possible. We're still watching the weekend, specifically Friday night into Saturday for our next potential snowmaker. Still some differences in the track of that system, so stay tuned 
for updates. But that's our next best chance of seeing some accumulating snow. Then the cold weather greets us for the start of next week and maybe a little bit of a colder and snowier pattern as we head into the end of this month. So here is the Beltline at Park Street. No major problems showing up there. Uh, near Brooklyn, though, we do have a accident. Road is closed on uh, US 14 from uh, Waterman Road to Rome Corners Road. So I'm going to make you aware of that. That accident just uh, coming into our offices in the last 15 minutes or so. On the Beltline, a pretty normal picture for this time of day. Not looking too bad. Close to Stoughton Road and the interstate. But we are noticing some slowdowns in both directions close to Fish Hatch and Seminole Highway on the eastbound side. So Verona Road eastbound to John Nolan a little bit slow at 11 minutes, an average speed of around 25 miles per hour. And some other routes in and around Madison, not looking too bad downtown northbound to Sun Prairie. That's only 15 minutes with an average speed of around 35 miles per hour. And that is your first alert traffic update. I know when it is cold outside during the middle of the winter, you know, if it's going to be this cold, you want some snow mm -hmm. to come our way. So maybe as we head into this weekend, that becomes a reality. All right. Thanks, Dave. All right. Thanks, Dave. Ahead at five, a new study outlines the dangers of speeding on America's roadways. How they're urging drivers to slow down. That's just ahead.
Just about everyone speeds occasionally, but a new report illustrates the deadly consequences. Now advocates are pushing for new measures to get drivers to slow down. Chris Van Cleve reports. In October, surveillance video caught this car speeding down a Milwaukee street before the driver lost control and crashed. Six people were inside. 18-year-old Zion Lewis was killed. Her friends and family remembered her at a vigil. They need to slow down. They need to slow down. And they've taken my, my niece's life away. I don't know what else it's going to take. A new report from the Governor's Highway Safety Association shows nearly 10,000 people died in speed-related crashes in 2017. That's similar to drunk driving deaths and much higher than the number of people killed in distracted driving accidents. But advocates say speeding isn't taken as seriously. Why is that? Because we all, we all speed, we're, we're, we're guilty of it, we, we're in a rush to get where we're going. We talk about drunk driving, we talk about distracted driving, but we don't talk about speed in that same context and we really need to. Jonathan Atkins is GHSA's executive director and says part of the problem is nearly every state has raised speed limits over the last two decades. And we're, what we're seeing is really a double whammy effect. Speed limits are going up, uh, but the public thinks they can go 5, 10, 15 miles an hour above that posted speed limit. Atkins says when speed limits were lowered in New York City and Boston, traffic deaths dropped. He also wants police to crack down on speeders. The study suggests expanding the use of automated speed cameras, which have been effective at getting drivers to slow down. And how important is enforcement? Enforcement's a big key to this. If people feel like they're going to get a ticket, their behavior changes. A change out of the fast lane that could save lives. Chris Van Cleve, CBS News, Washington. And stay with us. We'll have another check of your forecast in just a moment.
Windy and chilly tonight. Yeah, the cold front coming through right now, so a little bit blustery outside. Temperatures will fall from the 30s into the mid 20s to start off tomorrow and a little bit of patchy freezing drizzle is possible. The good news is tomorrow we get the clouds out of here for the most part and we actually see a little bit of sunshine. How about that? Temperatures will be right around 30 degrees for highs. We stay pretty chilly into the weekend with some accumulating snow possible by Friday and Saturday. All right, Dave, thank you. CBS Evening News coming away next. We're back in 30 minutes for News 3 at 6.